Welcome back, Board Game Crusaders. Today we're going to be covering Conquest of Planet Earth and Apocalypse, the expansion to the game. Now this is only going to be covering one of the variants to play. This is going to be the competitive variant. I will make a separate video that talks about the solo play and cooperative play. This will just focus on the competitive aspect of the game. So if you're interested in the single player or, or cooperative, check out the other video. Because the two styles play completely different. This game is literally just like getting two in one box. It's pretty cool. Here are some of the components that I may be mentioning periodically through the game. This is where you get to find out what those are, so pay close attention. Some of them I will not reference anymore. Some of them I'll be mentioning in the game and you'll need to know this is what I'm referring to. Let's start with these two. These came in the expansion. They are for specific alien groups. And uh, it'll just be mentioned on the alien card if you need them or not. So, as well as the rules on how to use them. So I won't go into those anymore, but now you know what they look like and how to find out what they do. Um, this is a demolish token. Anytime that you want to pull one over on your enemy and just kind of ruin their day, you can demolish one of their areas with an event card or an item card or something to that effect. Anything that says to demolish land, you push this on it, and that makes these values, the zero and the zero, take over whatever the other value was. So if they had worked hard and long and taken over this, and there's no way you can get it from them, boom, demolish it, and it's not worth their three points anymore. Um, then we have the currency of the game, the Alien Menace tokens. Throughout this tutorial, I may call these the currency, the cash, the coins, whatever I may slip up and say, just know I'm referring to the Alien Menace tokens if it's referring to paying something to do something, unless I specifically say you're paying an action point. Here is the completely useless um, first player turn order marker. You don't really need this anymore, but Hey, the frog looks pretty terrified. How cute is that? This is one of the reasons why I love Flying Frog games. They make little tokens that have no rules in the game, and they have seemingly no bearing in the game. So you can make up your own rules, or, more importantly, they can be implemented in future expansions, which Flying Frog Productions prints or, or produces on their website completely free. All you have to do is go read them, print them, whatever, and you can use these for officially sanctioned rules. It's like a free expansion that they throw in the box as a teaser that you just get as soon as they come out with the rules. And then the terror points. These uh, were introduced in the expansion as a solution to Places like the grassy fields. Now the grassy fields have their place, and playing with them can be pretty fun. Unless you land on it on your turn. <laughs> and it's kind of frustrating because it's not worth any victory points. You don't have to fight anything, it's not worth points, it's just a spot that you wasted your activation getting to. Necessary evil. Now, with the terror points, you have an option you did not have before. You can sacrifice your alien, in effect killing it so that you can place a terror point in that region, making it worth one terror point instead of zero terror points. Now, you can only use this on places that have already been, that have not already been conquested, that don't have anybody to fight, and don't have any victory points. So, keep that in mind when you're trying to sacrifice your unit for the terror points. And of course, the conquest I didn't really cover yet, but it should be obvious from that, Conquest markers show you what areas you control. They come in a character matching each flying saucer set so that you can uh, conquest and then fly off to capture new regions. These little bad boys are the allies that you can get through space stuff. If you come across these, you are a lucky, lucky person. They're really cool and they help a lot. Um, when you do have these guys in play, they get all of your bonuses unless the bonus specifically refers to your alien race name. Uh, another difference that you'll notice when we're, when we're doing the battle, when your alien gets destroyed, you can typically bring it back in for an action point. I'll cover that in a minute, so don't wrap your head around it too much yet. But uh, needless to say, these guys do not get to come back. If they're destroyed, 
They are just gone, eliminated, wiped out. These are the command counters. Every single uh, alien faction is going to get this same set of command counters. Command counters are how you bid for your turns. If you play a higher number, you'll get to do more things that turn. However, if you play a lower number, you'll get to go first. So the way that works is the number indicates how many actions you get for that turn. So if you play the six, you get six actions. If you play the two, you only get two actions, but you probably get to go first because you played the lowest number. So if you wanna go first, play low. If you wanna go all out and move a lot of people, play high. Now the D6 is just like it sounds. You roll a six-sided dice, and that indicates how, how many moves you get and also indicates where you're going to fall in um, the initiative order. Now if you're rolling for your d6 and you get a 1, not all is lost. Basically that means you get to grab yourself one of these little coins and re-roll the dice. If you get a 1 again, you're stuck with a 1. You don't get to get another little um, money coin and you have to just do the 1. You have to accept the second result. So the D6 can have a good little risk reward system going on. Another thing to note is when you are both bidding for your turns, say this turn I wanted to take a lot of actions, I bid my six, and they bid, who knows, their two. So they played their two, I bid my six, they go first, I get to make six moves. This goes into a discard pile. And all of these go into a discard pile as you use them until you're out of all of them except the D6. Once you've used all of them except your D6 and all you've got left is your D6, you can bring them all back and the cycle begins again. Now, the reason why you may still have your D6 at the end is because your D6 is the exception to the rule. You never have to discard that. You can play that every single time and retain all of these for safekeeping in case you want to use those. So the D6 never goes to the discard. If you bid the D6, you get to keep the D6 and use it again next turn if you choose. The rest of them go to the discard until all you have left is your D6 and then they refresh. I hope that's clear. I think I went through it enough that it makes a lot of sense to me. So now we're gonna go over the game map. Um, just briefly for one component that I'm not gonna really mention in the game. That's the randomizer right here in the middle of the board. Essentially what this does is anytime that something calls for a random tile, you select the tile and then roll a dice. I got a one. So if you couldn't tell, that means this is the tile that's affected because of the randomizer here. So that's how you'll use the randomizer. It's not really gonna come up any more than that in this demonstration. So now you know. I've got to say that Flying Frog Productions never ceases to impress with the quality of their card stock. These cards, I don't know if you can see in the camera, but they have a kind of a glossy, almost laminated feel. I have taken these camping, I've had stuff spilled on them, and they are just amazing. Now, I wouldn't recommend st spilling stuff on them intentionally, but high quality components in every Flying Frog game I've ever played. But let's go over the event cards. The event cards are cards that you keep in your hand and they are drawn at specific times which we'll cover. That's not relevant here. What is, is the kind of the outline of the card. Some events will cost you action points uh, to utilize. That represents how many action points the card takes to use. And then it has what you get for the card, whether it remains in play or whether it's a flash in the pan will be determined on whether it says remains in play. The stuff in the red you're going to ignore for this tutorial. That's more for the, um, the single player or the cooperative playthrough. You don't need it for this one. And then uh, there's the play immediately cards. And just as it sounds, if you draw a play immediately card, you play it immediately. If you're drawing multiple cards in your turn and more than one arm play immediately, then you decide which order you're going to play them in, but they all must be played immediately. We also have space stuff. I'll talk about how to get space stuff and how to use space stuff in the tutorial, but just to cover what space stuff does, 
um, it has an ability that you get to use. They're typically active abilities that are just utilized as long as the card's in front of you, unless it says activate. If it says activate, then you can use it once per turn by activating it. The rules say flip the card over to represent it's activated. Uh, from a Magic the Gathering background, I just tap it to indicate that it's activated. Not all of these um, Space Stuff cards will need to be activated. As I said, some of them are just always active as long as you control them in front of you. But there are the ones that need to be activated, and that's how you can determine. And again, just follow the text on the card so you know what's going on with what you're doing. There are several locations in the deck, or in the game, that you get to draw from. We'll cover that in more detail as we go through the game, as usual. Um, but, here we have the terror points that the location is worth if you conquer it. This is how many resistant uh, battles that you have to fight to conquer it. That is any special abilities or effects that this area may have. These indicate what type of a plant of an area it is. Uh, there are certain resistant uh, cards that will interact with these and give the resistance an advantage. There are also event cards that will give you an advantage in specific areas. And then the top has the name of what kind of an area it is. Um, alternately, there is the capital city, which is intended to be placed in the center of the game. Uh, it's kind of the coveted area because it's worth a lot more terror points than some of the others. Alternately, the base game has on the back of that a historic monument. And then the expansion added this alternate capital city with this alternate. We're going to talk about the resistance here. The base game comes with the land resistance and the expansion added the coastal resistance. Those are going to function pretty similarly. Um, the expansion also added land type with this coastal symbol. If it has the coastal symbol, uh, you draw from the coastal resistance. Or some of the coastal uh, cards say right here that you roll a dice to determine if they're coming from the land or the sea. So you just follow those as needed to determine whether you're using the coastal deck or the land deck. The way the cards are going to break down is you're going to see here um, the name of the card. You're going to see the strength value of the card, which you're comparing against your alien strength. If it has any abilities, it'll be here. For instance, this one gains plus four strength in any town. As you recall on these indicators right here, it shows what kind of a location it is, so you just compare that to that to figure out what kind of bonuses these guys get, if any. So, and then you're going to see if they're soft or hard or none of the above, which just basically means to the alien if they're chewy, they're soft, if they're crunchy, they're hard. And some of the alien factions give you special abilities depending on soft, hard. Not all of them though, so that really doesn't come up as often as you'd think. Um, other hero or other resistance types are the heroes. It says right there if it's a hero, everything else is pretty similar except if you draw a hero card, you also draw the next card after it and you combine those powers. So that gives a plus one strength to whatever you drew, plus this ability to whatever you drew. And then whatever you drew not only has what it has, but it has this additional. So in this case, we drew a US Army Artillery with a forest ranger. How cool is that? Since we're going over a resistance card, let's go over the resistance tokens and how they interact with the competitive game. Mostly you're going to want to take most of them and just put them to the side. From the base game, the only ones you're going to use are the paratroopers and the infantry. And then from the expansion, the aircraft carriers and destroyers, which is really all the expansion added as far as uh, resistance tokens. But, so these are pretty straightforward to read, as we can see here, that's an air type, um, which can interact with your specific aliens, uh, depending on their abilities. Uh, that is the strength, which equates essentially to this, if it were a card. And it's got the ability, the ability right here on the bottom, this one gives a crushing victory on a 5 or 6. As we can see from... The original paratroopers, it also gives a crushing victory on a fight roll of 5 or 6. These come into play when the card specifically says so. So on the paratroopers card, it says, when drawn, also place a paratrooper resistance counter in one other random space on the board selection. 
So that's pretty much how these work with the addition of this little circle. Um, being outlined in red indicates that it's a soft creature. Indicated by the blue border um, shows that it's a hard uh, resistance. Now these big ones are also a little different in the fact that the little ones do not offer you victory points for defeating them. They're just hindrances. If you end a movement, or you, you really can't move through them. If you hit a square that has one of these tokens in it, you have to stop there and you have to fight them. Uh, whereas uh, these guys, not only do you have to stop there and fight them if they're there, but you have to defeat them twice. You have to defeat them once, they flip over, you have to defeat them a second time, and then if you can do that, you get a terror point. If you can't, it remains like this for the next person to come across and pick up half the battle that you've already done half the work for them. So uh, that brings to another important point when placing these. Um, we already know how the randomizer works. So let's say the infantry are kicking it right here and you draw a paratrooper and the paratrooper is supposed to go right here. What's going to happen is the paratrooper goes in, the infantry moves to the middle. And that continues that way. Now the middle can only ever have three um, indicators or resistance counters at, a, at any given time. If there are more than that, then um, the one that's trying to move in can't move in. It gets blocked and it stays here until there's three here. So hopefully that doesn't ever happen. <laughs> now that brings you to a question probably. The question in your mind is, well, what if this isn't the city capital? What if this is my starting position? Well, that simply means you can still play an action point as usual to put aliens in here, but then the aliens can't do anything that turn. They can't begin moving. They have to immediately resolve battle um, because they can't move when they're there. The rules also do not clarify these guys since they can only come in at the ports indicated by the anchor symbol. It doesn't say how these guys move in but I would presume that uh, if a paratrooper was supposed to land where the aircraft carrier is, the aircraft carrier is in fact not going to move in because it's in a water zone. Um, you would have to move the paratrooper in. But since the rules aren't clear on that, at least the, the rules that came printed with the game, they may have a FAQ later, you can either move the paratrooper in or you can say the paratrooper is going to be there. Um, whatever you want to do. Which brings me to another good point. Let's say that the random place they have to go is somewhere that you've already conquered. What's going to happen is the paratrooper comes in, the conquest marker goes away, and then you have to fight the paratrooper to get to this. The rules, to my knowledge, don't specify whether or not um, defeating the paratrooper just gives you the victory point. I think that's what's understood because it doesn't clarify any further, but I've added a house rule or got it in my head somehow. Maybe I read an FAQ online or something where if uh, the paratrooper comes in and liberates it, even after you defeat the paratrooper, you have to then come in and defeat the uh, resistance value again. That's the way I like to play it. It makes it a little more challenging. Here's a phrase I find myself saying a lot when I do my reviews in the setup portion, but setup is very straightforward in this game. The base game has a two, three, and four player setup referenced on page seven of the rule book. Uh, there's the two player setup, three player setup, four player setup. Um, when you're playing the game, each player always starts. So in a two player setup, you'd start on the ends. Three player setup, you'd start on the ends. Four player setup, you'd start on the ends always leaving the center as the place where you put the capital city, whatever you're using in the center. Now, the expansion added a couple other things. It added a five-player game where, again, everybody always starts in this, on the edges. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, five-player game. Oh, yeah, never mind. So these two are the center in the five-player game. So one, two, three, four, five... And then six player game, um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Incidentally, that's another reason why the expansion added another city capital, so you could do that. Um, and then the expansion offer also added this brutal setup, 
where there are no centers. There is a center piece that's placed in there, but everybody's a lot closer without that center keeping them apart. Um, so there's a four player setup and a six player setup for Brutal, which does make the combat a lot uh, more accessible. So when setting up, this is the two player setup. You place the capital in the center. Now, incidentally, these spots where your flying saucers will start will never have any kind of a land marker. So to set up, each player places their four aliens in their starting section. The middle tile gets out. You look at your alien reference sheet. You draw that many event cards as of for your intelligence value. And then every player also gets to start out with one of the resources. And then each turn begins with a, a bid. Each player is going to say bid one of these bad boys here, reveal at the same time. This person goes first, this person gets more moves. So let's just say two is blue, six is green. You discard the counters you played unless it was the D6. And once you get down to just your D6, you would refresh just like I went over. So we'll not cover that in more detail now. So the blue person gets to go first. He has two moves. The very first thing you need to do is ready any tap or flipped over cards that you have. So that is these cards that have the activate that you can only use once per turn. If you had any that you either tapped or flipped over to indicate you had used it on the previous turn, before you divvy out your actions, you set this right so that you know you can use it again this turn if you'd like to. Again, he had two actions because he bid two. So what you can do with those actions is you can move one alien one space. So if he wanted two, he could go one, two. And then he could have this location fortified with two aliens instead of one. Or if he wanted to be a little more bold, he could go one, two. So moving aliens is one of the things you can do. Returning a downed alien to the base is another thing. So let's say they had a battle and they lost one or more aliens. For one action point, you can place one of your downed aliens back in your starting zone. Now two action points will give you one of these currencies. Um, so if you spend two action points instead of moving or doing anything else, you just get one of those to utilize. Um, some of the cards, um, the event cards, have a cost value right here as referenced earlier. Now any of these event cards with a cost value can only be utilized during the action phase when you're moving aliens and spending action points. Uh, this would be the time to use them and as many points as it costs to use it is what you're going to have to spend. So if this guy wanted to play this card, since he only has two, that's all he'd be able to do this turn. And again, the expansion added these little terror things I already covered in great detail, but that's another thing you can choose to spend three of your action points doing. So, um, for this guy's turn, he's going to go one, two. He's going to play it safe. Once you're there, you reveal your location. So he's got a location here. That's the atomic power plant. We already know how this works with all of these symbols and these symbols, so we're not covering that right now. Um, but suffice it to say, it's it's got a resistance of two. So let's say the blue player was playing with these guys. Their strength is three. That means each of their ships has a strength value of three. So right off the bat, I have six strength going into the battle because I have two ships. Three and three. Now if I had just one ship, it would just be three, which is why he chose to move two in there just to be safe. So after the action phase, you reveal the cards and go into the, bat or the locations that you've moved on to and go into the battle phase. So in the battle phase, you reveal any um, unexplored locations. So this is an unexplored location. We reveal a location card and place it there. Now note this has a resistance of two. That means we're going to go into a fight. I'm not going to explain anything else here because we already covered that in pretty good detail. And uh, so now I've got my two aliens there and we are going to be having a fight. Now when you're referencing your 
um, your event card, your space stuff. There are a couple different things, uh, so a couple different key terms you're going to want to know. A battle is all fights in a given location. So if this location had aliens and then I had to fight, so I, a competitive alien, and then I had to fight the location as well, um, I don't really see how that could happen, but every single fight that goes on in a location on your turn constitutes the battle. The fight is a single combat. So in this case, if you recall, the resistance was two. This will have two fights in it. Now a fight round is a round of fights between actions and resistance, or aliens and resistance. So a fight round would be all two of the fights constituting one fight round. So as you're reading the cards, now you know what a battle, a fight, and a fight round are. Um, you always begin with the battle phase, well, I guess after you've revealed the locations, by fighting in contested areas. In this case, this is the only contested area, and so we'll run down how the battle works. Um, you draw resistance cards for the first battle, and let's say that the blue aliens are these guys. Their strength total, or their strength is three. That means each uh, UFO that they have has a value of three, which will come into play here. So that's three, and three makes six. Now let's see what the resistance has coming for us. Um, it looks like they have a strength of five. So it's a good thing I moved two aliens in there because already I'm only winning by one point and we haven't even finished yet. Um, then at this point you have an opponent roll a red dice representing the resistance and you roll a white dice representing yourself. You add the values. So in this case there was a tie because my six plus two tied his five plus three. They both totaled eight. So in the case of a tie, no ground was won, and you did not complete one of the fights. You will have to keep fighting until there is a victor to solve the round. So here we have a strength of three. So far this looks favorable because I have a strength of six. So I think I can do this. You roll the dice again. So they have six total, and I have ten total. That means I defeated one of the two needed to capture the area. So that, again, was a fight. Now let's try to complete the fight round by doing this again. Here we have the Duke, who is a hero, who has a strength of plus three to whatever you draw next, and Cunning which means he rolls an extra fight dice and uses the highest value. That might be pretty tricky. So we have a cunning, um, another hero. So that's going to add, this is just going to be bad for the aliens. And oh my goodness, is that another hero? <laughs> so we're going to ignore everything except the cunning so far, just for the sake of speed. So already though, they're at three, four, five, six, seven, and they haven't even got their base yet. And another hero. So there's nine. If this is a hero, I'm just gonna say it's not. Oh good. <laughs> and look at that. That's a heavy tank. So they're at seventeen, and I'm at six. I think even rolling my dice, I am SOL, unless I get a six. Now if I were to get a six, it would be a crushing blow and I would automatically win. If the resistance gets a six, it's a crushing blow and they automatically win. If we both get a six, it's a tie and the battle was just doesn't count towards anything. So let's roll the dice again looking for the red for the resistance. They got a six, so it doesn't matter what I got. I took a defeat here. As if I had any chance anyway with all that they had. My only hope was to get a six. So Claire, another point here is if I did have any event cards that I could play, you can play those at any time unless it specifies otherwise on the event card, even after the dice are rolled. So if I had something that would make me get a 6, I could roll my dice first. If I didn't get my 6 naturally, I could play it at this point. You can play those at any time to, to buff yourself or to hurt a friend that you're playing against or whatever. But in this case, I lost. I have a couple of choices. First of all, this isn't a choice. My guy gets defeated, he comes off the board, 
Again, I can use a, a, an action point to put him back on my next turn, but for now he's gone. Now I have one alien left and one battle left. I have a choice to make. I can fight on and hope that I get a better resistance draw this time around, or I can try to run away like a coward with my tail between my legs to any surrounding area that I have a friendly figure in. These are always considered uh, for the purpose of retreating friendly with a enemy in, or with a with a unit in it. Even if it was empty, you could always retreat to your friendly home base. So in this case, I don't know if I want to risk it. It's worth three points. I've already defeated one of them. If I do retreat and decide to come back with more friends, I would have to start over with my two. I would be essentially having to fight two again. So rather than just risking that, I think I'm going to risk losing my ship. And I'm going to say I'm going to fight again. Hopefully live to see another day. Not so bad. Um, it's just a, well, maybe it is. It's an eight. <laughs> I've only got a strength of three. As you'll recall, my buddy was killed. So if I can roll myself a six, or what else do I need? Well, I guess it depends on what he rolls, so I'm just hoping for a six. Again, they're red, I'm white. Okay, so we tied on that, which means he won, and I just lost the fray. No big deal. We'll come back, try to win another day. Again, we have to start back from scratch. Now, let's say for instance that the paratrooper was summoned there. Let's kind of redo that battle. Um, if there was one or more of these tokens on the land, before fighting the land I'd have to fight these guys off, which aren't worth any victory points or anything. They're just a hindrance for you. So you really don't want to see them on in your way because you have to fight them before you can go for the victory. If there's more than one of these on a spot, you fight them in whatever order you determine like to. Battle works the same except instead of drawing random cards you just fight against that value. Um, now fighting against fellow aliens works similarly to fighting any other round. So let's just say we got this battle going on. As you'll recall um, the blue guys have a strength of three so with two ships they have six strength and the green guys have a strength of two so with three strips, they have six strength. Let's say the red dice represents the green. So here we have a one for the blue and a three for the green. The green took victory, which means they lose a guy. And that was one of the fights. The fight round would continue, or the battle would continue until someone either was completely defeated or retreated. And either side at this point, after the first fight, can, or any subsequent fight can determine whether they want to flee or stay and see it through. So I believe that's going to cover everything we're going to need for fighting with a couple important uh, exceptions to that. If we did win this battle, for instance, we would be able to place um, one of our blue conquest markers there and then we could leave it and know that we have the three conquest points for it. And we could continue to explore if we want. Now leaving those unguarded is a little foolhardy because if an enemy comes in and lands there they can then just simply replace that without any battles at all whatsoever because it's already been done. So after the battle phase you have your draw phase which as you'll recall you have a certain number of event cards of event cards equal to your intelligence. If you've got this hand, for instance, and you really don't like this card, you don't think you'll ever use it, when you get to your draw phase, you can always discard one of the cards that you don't think you'll want, and then draw back up to your hand. So if I only had this card and I didn't think I'd use it, I could discard it and draw three more in the case of these guys, because their intelligence is three. Or if I had three cards, I could discard one so I could draw one to hopefully get a fresher hand than what I've got. Well that's the game, pure and simple. Uh, it just goes until somebody has eight terror points. Now the second someone hits eight terror points, the game ends. Which you may think is unfair for the poor second player, but remember, if they thought they had a chance of winning or wanted to thwart the other person, they could have tried to play a lower initiative and beaten them to the punch. But they didn't, so if 
uh, the first player wins on their turn and the second player doesn't get their follow-up turn, all is fair in Alien War.